So let's take a look at it. Here's our data that we've pulled over from Connect, and we can see that we've simplified this a little bit. In our regular data, we have many, many um, predictors, but for the purposes of the timing of this webinar, I've simplified it. We have machine, injection pressure, injection temperature, cooling temperature, we have a melt zone, mold temperature, and our end item, our strength. So this predictive analytics module, if you don't have the add-on, all of these things will be gray. So you'll see them that they're out there, but you need to get with your account executive and uh, figure out what it takes for your organization to bring this in. But I can see that I have Mars regression. Now, the one thing that I wanted to point out is that don't let the dialog box fool you. This is a very precise technique, very precise algorithm, works great with complex data. But as I look at this dialog box, I'm like, well, gosh, this is super simple. Um, hats off to our development team to make this so easy for folks to use. I don't have to go through textbooks and you know, go through a bunch of code and debug and try to figure out how to make this work. All I know is what is my response, in this case, strength, what are my continuous predictors? So I've pulled injection pressure through mold temperature. And what are my categorical predictors? Now you can run this as is, but there are a few adjustments out there. I'm gonna just cover a couple. You can identify if you want interactions included. For this example, I'm just doing this additive model just for simplicity, but you can allow interactions. And the other thing that might be something that you would want to adjust based on your data is your validation method. So you can either have no validation, but you risk overfitting. Or if you have a fair amount of data, kind of a long data set, as opposed to how many predictors you have, you could probably do validation with the test set. And that's where you're going to build a model with maybe 70, 75% of the data hold back 25 to 30% to test it to see how well it works. Or in this case, I have a relatively short data set. K-fold cross-validation works quite well. Uh, behind the scenes, there's a subset of some folds that get averaged, and that will create my validation set to test the predictability of the model that I've built. And if ever you get stuck on any of this, you can always go to the help screen and Minitab Help is going to take you right to the spot that's most likely going to answer your questions. So uh, please utilize that help screen. It, it's very helpful. And there's some other tuning parameters, but I'm going to just run it in the default for time's sake. And let's see what we get. So what happened is the Mars algorithm looked at 30 base functions to fit that adaptive spline. I'm going to skip to the down, and we'll come back to this in a second. So what we found is the fit is around 70%. So my predicted side, my test side is about 69%. Training side is about 75 I always like it when these are fairly close to each other. That means my model's pretty stable. And so roughly about 70% fit. That's pretty good. So 70% of the variation in strength can be affected or can be explained by the model. And if I would have used more of my predictors, I kind of probably could have made that a little bit better. But uh, I'm trying to focus on the big hitters here. The next step is looking at how did those inputs affect my output. So I can see that injection pressure, that has the biggest effect. So as I change injection pressure, it has the most effect on strength. Mold temperature, machine, cooling temperature, and melt temperature are my next group. Well, let's talk about interpretation, and we'll get back into the guts of the model a little bit more. Uh, when I look at scatter plot, generally these have a linear pattern. 
Yeah, you could argue there's some spread about that. Well, that's why I have a 70% fit and not a 90% fit. But I think for early production, that's pretty good. Uh, I'll I'll take 70%. So how are we going to use this? Well, now I can look and see there is a nonlinear pattern in how injection pressure affects strength. And remember, I was already knowing what I thought my control space was going to be, what my limits are going to be. And I was varying within that space. But now what I've been able to flush out is, oh, well, if I'm in this uh, you know, lower range, which would be, you know, maybe let's say less than 130, um, I'm going to have strength decline and then maybe come back up. So now I can talk amongst my cross-functional group and say, you know, I think our best bet is maybe redu reducing our space here to maybe 125 to 150. We're going to have much better results in this area than we're going to have down in this area. What other patterns do I see? Well, mold temperature. Well, one of the things I can see here is that I have an optimum that's kind of right around 300 degrees. Well, this is very interesting to me because think about it this way. For me to get higher mold temperatures that before we've identified were okay, I'm going to have to put more and more energy into that heating element. Well, more and more energy means higher and higher cost. So not only do I have the ability to identify an optimal area for long-term quality reducing risk, I also identify that, hey, this area down here, which is gonna be a lower energy than what we thought we needed, is gonna be my optimum area. So lower cost process, longer term, we have mitigated risks. That's a win-win. And sure enough, I have a linear trend in cooling temp. The higher the cooling temperature, the better. We may want to restrict into somewhere in up this upper zone so I get the best possible chance of making a strong part. And then this one is very interesting to me because remember, we, we had this linear model, and I'll show you in a minute, but I can see here I have this whole big flat of high strength parts. And as long as I don't go above, let's say, around 215 degrees in this uh, melt zone, I'm going to have strong parts, the highest strength. So once again, low cost, high quality in this particular zone. So in just these plots, I've now learned a ton about my process. And by the way, if we look at this in comparison to our linear model, remember we said we might hit a linear model first. So let's, uh, let's put that in here and split it. When I look at fit, the best fit I get from a prediction standpoint is about 48%. My Mars hits at 68%. So fit is much better. And when I look at my plots, I can see that, oh, I assumed this linear pattern of injection, but it's highly nonlinear. So this may have really misled me on where my best areas are for operating. Like, especially when I look at mold temp, it's telling me, oh, yeah, go the higher the better. But that's not what Mars is finding as we get this more precise model in place. So very interesting how I can get these fine-tuned elements. And lastly, we'll get into a little bit of the detail. So we can see what's happened is we have all these base functions, but there is a way from a machine learning standpoint, there's an optimal number of base functions that was identified. In this particular case, it was nine. As I go above nine, I'm not gonna get a whole lot better. And I get this beautiful equation that I can now use to predict. So um, I've actually added that to my data set by using my button below. Oops. And I can now get all my predicted fits 
or if I wanted to, and I wanted to try out some scenarios, I can just go to the bottom and I can plug in some individual values and I can get some predictions on what I can expect, which is even better for fine tuning some possible scenarios on what I might want to have as a new control space.